Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. In this video, I think you're gonna find it more interesting than several of the other videos where we just focused on learning how to graph exponentials, how to solve equations, it was pretty dry stuff. Uh, we did have a video where I discussed exponential growth and I talked about the coronavirus spread and uh, that kind of gave you a glimpse on how you can use exponentials to model real life events and real life behavior of certain systems. So this section is going to actually focus more on that side of things by giving you a few more examples on where exponentials and logarithms can be used, right? So we're not going to spend too much time on the dry things, we're just gonna try to give you a glimpse of different applications. Now, of course, there's the typical applications like compound interest, uh, but I want to focus uh, on, I'm going to start out be, with the, with a very cool and very interesting application, which is uh, radioactive decay, and it's used in what we call carbon dating. All right, so you probably see this uh, picture right uh, in my split screen here. Look at this picture of a bull. This is pretty cool, isn't it? Well, this is a French website. Does anyone know? what this place is. Well, this place is called Lasso. It's in France, right? This is, these are called the Lasso Caves. This is a painting. This bull picture here is actually a painting, one of these wall paintings in this cave. And I'm going to tell you a really interesting story about this. And then we're going to relate it to a math problem, which is kind of cool. So the, the story goes is that on September 12th, 1940, four boys were walking around in the woods near this little town in France called the town of Montignac in the Dordogne region. And they were just walking around, four boys, and they have a dog. And the dog somehow got lost. And they were looking for the dog. Uh, and one of the boys his name is uh, Marcel Ravida, was looking for the dog and they could hear the dog and they're looking around for the dog, but they can't find him. And then uh, Marcel was able to uh, hear or locate where the dog was barking from and he found this little opening in, into the ground. And he was, he slid all the way to the bottom and found himself uh, in this like little cave system that was in the middle of the woods mm -hmm. and this near this little vi village called Montignac that nobody knew about. So his uh, three friends uh, went back after him and after constructing a makeshift lamp to light their way, they found a wider variety of animals. So he uh, he was able to uh, see all these paintings in the in these cave walls and they started to discover all these interesting animals all over these caves. So just to kind of put you in the shoes of these kids and how, what they went through, uh, the cool thing about this is that the Minister of um, Culture in France has a website that gives you a virtual tour of the, these caves. So let's do a little guided tour just to kind of give you an idea of what's inside these caves. Which is really cool. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about what they did with these caves. actual drawings in these caves. This is a reproduction of the drawings. Notes on the bottom, it tells you which room you're in. Each room has its its own uh, name. They have names for all these different walls and rooms. Look at this, there's two horses there. There's the horse there, and there's one that's above it. Walls again. Chamber of 
of the felines, a few figures, so this is gonna have some feline figures. Is that brilliant? That's excellent. So, so tell you. Let me tell you a little bit about the, what happened with the discovery. So, after the discovery, obviously this was a big deal, and scientists poured into this, archaeologists, and they were going into this cave. The problem, though, is that people started going on to, into these caves, and they were started contaminating these caves because they're bringing in. The breath, when they breathe in there, they contaminate uh, the air in these caves, and it started, it started uh, ruining these paintings, all these paintings. Uh, so what they did, they ac ended up actually closing up the caves. So they ended up closing up the caves and building a replica cave that people could go into. And then eventually, obviously more recently, they had this virtual tour, which basically you can just visit it, know exactly what's in the cave, and you don't uh, do damage to the actual cave. So the, the cave, uh, the actual cave system has been closed for a long time to be preserved from the public. Because again, for a while they let people go in, and it ended up ruining a lot of, ruining a lot of the paintings. Now they didn't just find, find paintings, they found the remains of fires, can you, can you imagine like wood in, in like a fire pit from these ancient folks, the dwellers of these caves? Of course, they they try to decipher all what all these symbols are and what all these depictions are, and they wanted to know what you probably already wondering about is how old are these these paintings? How long ago have they been around? Like because if you know how long ago these paintings had been drawn or how long ago that fire pit existed or that fire was started then that gives you an idea how long ago the the folks that painted these pictures have been around and uh, using carbon dating which is the technique we're going to use that uses exponential decay we are able to do that using a simple mathematical problem okay so first of all Let's uh, discuss a few things, mathematical, and then we're gonna look at the problem that will help us estimate, and this is based on true data that I put together, that will help us estimate roughly what the age of these uh, caves are and the folks that lived there. All right, so exponential
models. So we already talked about this when we looked at exponential growth with the coronavirus spread. But in general, an exponential model is some kind of formula that has an exponential in it that you can use it to model some change in real life. But when we learned about exponentials, we learned that exponentials don't just grow. You could have an exponential decay. So if you have a population growth, you can use an exponential model. If you have a, a, a spread of an epidemic, you can use an exponential model. But you can also use an exponential model if you have radioactive decay. So let me tell you a little bit about radioactive decay. Let's explain what that means. Now, you may have heard about this in chemistry and in biology, but we will pretend you haven't seen it anywhere else. So I'll give you a little bit of information about this that will be good enough background to help us understand it. All right, so let's give you an example of what radioactive decay means, right? So chemical substances over time will start to degrade. So if left alone, over time, they start to degrade. So let me give you uh, uh, the best example, which is the most useful example, in, is carbon. Carbon has two isotopes. It has carbon-12, which we just write C12, and carbon-14, which is C14, right? So carbon-12 is stable, which means it doesn't change. It doesn't degrade over time. But carbon-14 is radioactive, which means if left alone after a long, long, long time, the amount of carbon-14 will start to decrease. Now, what's interesting about it, though, is the way it decreases. It doesn't drop really fast. It drops over a long period of time. In fact, the half-life of C14 is 5,730 years, roughly. All right, so I know you probably already wondered, what's this half-life, right? So what does half-life mean? Well, half-life is the time it takes initial amount to drop to its half. Okay, so let's say you started out with 10 grams of carbon-14. You have to wait, if left alone in nature, that 10 gram of uh, C14, it will take it about 5,730 years before it starts to uh, degrade until it gets to roughly half, which is five grams. Then that five grams, you have to wait another 5,730 years for that five grams to turn into 2.5. And that 2.5, you have to wait another 5,730 years for it to become 1.25, and you get the idea. So what does that look like if we try to picture that? Well, let's make a little graph. So this is time, and this right here is the amount of carbon. Oops, try that again. So the amount of carbon. So let's say, again, we're just going to use this example of 10 grams, let's say. So we'll do it right here. So let's say this is 10 grams. So that's the initial amount. So at t equals 0, you've got 10 grams. So if you wait 5,730 years, that 10 grams becomes 5 grams. So you get a point right there. Now let's say... I'm going to find, I'm going to wait another 5,730 years. So three squares later, 5,730 years, this right here will drop to its own half. So it becomes 2.5. 
and then you wait another 5,730 years, then this drops it to its own half. So it's going to be half of 2.5, which is 1.25, and so on. So we started from here. At 0, we had 10, and now we dropped like that. So if we graph it, this looks like an exponential decay. So what's special about exponential decay? Well, we know what's special about exponential growth. We already talked about that with the spread of an epidemic. Exponential growth takes off, starts to take off slowly and then speeds up. So it takes off really fast, very quickly, like this. Right, that's exponential growth. But exponential decay is slightly different. It's the reverse of that. So what does that mean? That means at the beginning, the amount is going to drop really fast because the slope of this if you draw a slope there, of the slope is at the beginning, it's kind of steep, but then it starts to flatten out. So what does that mean? The slope is actually how fast it's changing. So the more it flattens out, the slower it decreases. So that 10 gram initially drops really fast, but then it will take forever to entirely disappear. In fact, it may never disappear because even when you reach a point where you've got like 1.25, you have to wait 5,730 years to drop the 1.25 gram to half of it. And then you have to wait another 5,730 years for that half to drop to its own half and so on. So it could take forever and you'll still have a little very tiny amount still left over. It doesn't entirely go away. So there's an advantage to this. There are two advantages. The, the first advantage is that carbon exists in every, every uh, living being, right? So animal, plant, human, every being, every, any uh, living being has carbon in them and they have both isotopes in them, right? So carbon can help you date or figure out how old or how long ago something has been around. So let's give you a little scenario. So if a mammoth died many, many years ago and you find the remains of that mammoth, then you could estimate, if you can estimate roughly how much of the carbon is left over in the carcass that you found of that dead animal, and all you really need is roughly percentage. So if I know that maybe 30% of carbon-14 that existed in the animal when it was alive is still left over, then you know uh, you can actually figure out how old ago the animal, how long ago the animal died, which is amazing. And the cool thing about it is I'm going to show you how to do it through an example. And we're going to do that by dating or figuring out how old these caves have been around based on information that the the archaeologists that study these caves based on how much carbon 14 they estimated existed in some of these paintings and some of the wood that was in that burning fire that uh, that that fire pit the remains of the fire pit the other interesting thing is that you can do this with animals, with humans, you can do this with even trees. So uh, Crater Lake, Oregon, that's where a volcanic eruption has happened. It's a big touristic attraction. People go there to visit it and you find all these like aftermath of a volcano a long time ago, big volcanic eruption. Again, how, how can we uh, estimate how long ago the eruption took place? it's a geological event how can we tell well that's exactly what they do they basically were able to look at some of those trees that died in that volcano and they looked at the amount of carbon that's left over in the wood the of those trees and they were able to estimate uh, figure out how long ago the volcanic eruption uh, occurred now what's good about carbon uh, dayton is that it's something that you can do with a pocket calculator. So you don't need something really sophisticated to do this. You just need a good estimate of how much percentage of carbon-14 is left. 
And if you can know that, and usually that's not hard to make a quick uh, ballpark figure of that, then you can quickly come up with an age of, or, an, uh, or a number of years, which is kind of cool. So archaeologists can use this in the field without any sophisticated equipment or expect, uh, expensive equipment. How accurate is it? Usually we're talking about, there's like a, depending on what you're measuring, there's usually about a hundred year error margin. So if you're dating something that, if you're trying to find the age of something that happened a long, long, long time ago, a hundred year error margin is not a big deal. So it, it's, it's still really a decent um, accuracy level. Uh, now, if you want to nowadays to really get something much more accurate, like, you know, when they go into the pyramids and they look at some of these remains of mummies and, and they try to figure out how long ago they existed, uh, nowadays they use forensic techniques. Basically, they put them in CAT scans and they can actually do uh, very delicate uh, forensic, using forensic science, they can actually get much more accurate information about how long ago certain things existed. They can do it based on the cloth that the mummy is wrapped in. They can do it based on some of the materials that were used in embalming the, mum, the mummy. So they, can, they have many little things that they can analyze to help them get a good uh, guess on the age of that mummy, which is kind of cool. All right, so here is a problem that we'd like to uh, solve. So let's actually state the problem and then we'll solve it. So the problem here is the following. So the half-life, so this is an exercise. So the half-life of C14 is 5,730 years, okay? The remains let me see here, is this the one I want to do? Hmm, I actually want to do one with less, so, so let me see if I can show you the one I did with another class with the last so if not then I'll just do the Pompeii example all right we'll just do that one so we'll do the Pompeii example I thought I had the uh, other example up but I don't seem to seem to have lost it here so we'll do this this one. So here is what it says. It says the remains of a tree that died during the famous Mount Vesuvius volcanic eruption. that destroyed the ancient city of Pompeii has an estimated seventy nine percent left of its original C14 amount. So here comes the question. How long ago did the eruption take place? And we're going to round to the nearest year. All 
All right, so let's start. So first of all, we need some kind of formula to start with or some kind of exponential model. So exponential models is, you can write it as an exponential function, right? So you can write it. So what's a typical exponential function? Well, we know a typical exponential function is like b to the x. But we have to tweak it slightly here. First of all, we're not using x because my variable is not x here. My variable is t, which is time. And also, I don't want to use any base. I'm going to, I can use any base, but let's use the most natural of all bases, which is the natural base, which is base E, right? So let's use that as a blueprint. So um, the exponential model we're going to use, formula, is A of t equals A naught times E to the kt. All right, so there are a couple of interesting things to mention here. What's A? A here represents the amount of carbon-14, so that's why we're using A. So A of t is amount of carbon-14 after t years. Okay, how about a sub zero, or a naught? That's the initial amount of C14. So the original amount when the tree was alive. And how about uh, the K? K is the decay rate. Why is it a decay rate, not a growth rate? Well, because the amount is not in growing over time is decreasing, is decaying. So because of that, k should turn out to be a negative number. So k is negative. Now I do need to warn you about something. I like to use one formula and we can adapt it for both the growth case and the decay case. The growth, basically your k is positive and if it's a decay problem like this one, the k is negative. Some books and some authors will do it differently. Some, uh, I think even your textbook does this. So your textbook will have this formula where K is positive. So they'll use always K positive, right? So if it's a growth, it will be this formula. But if it's decay, they will put a negative in front of it. I'm not a big fan of that because that means you have to remember two formulas. You could just remember this formula and you can use it for either case. The difference is the when you do the calculation, if it's growth, the K will turn out to be positive. If it's decay, the K will turn out to be negative. So that's what I actually recommend using. So I recommend using one single formula instead of having to remember two separate ones and then get confused easily about which one to use when, right? So this is the formula we're going to use. Just remember that if you use it for a decay problem, the K will turn out to be negative. If you use it for a growth problem, the K will turn out to be positive, which kind of makes sense, right? All right. So I'm going to have to use this to my advantage, right? So I need to figure out what's how long ago uh, has this or how long ago has this volcanic eruption happened? So... One, the only, there are a couple issues. One issue is that I don't know, I'm trying to solve for T, right? So if you want to solve for T, that means you have to know everything else. So if I'm trying to solve for T, I need to find K, I need to fa find A naught, I need to find A of T, I, I need to find A of T, I need, I apologize, my dog's going nuts upstairs. I need to find uh, A naught, A of T, and K. A naught is not given, so I'm in trouble there. I have no idea what the initial amount of carbon-14 in that tree was. Right? A of T is not given. I don't know what the amount is right now. I just know it in proportion terms. I, I know that the amount is that's left over now is 79% of the initial amount. So that's going to be the key to unlocking this. So I'm going to be able to use that somehow and solve this problem without knowing what the initial amount is, which is kind of cool. 
And obviously, I'm, I don't know what the K is. So I'm going to have to somehow figure out the K. So the first step when you're do, dealing with these problems is find in K. So that's the first thing we're going to focus on. So finding K. So question mark, we need to find K. So how do you find K? To find K, we use the half-life hint. We use half-life. All right, so we know the half-life is 5,730 years. That's the standard half-life of carbon-14. So what does that mean? Okay, let's process that again. What does that mean? That means if I wait 5,730 years after the volcanic eruption, the amount of carbon that will exist will be half of the amount, half of the initial amount. So what does that mean? That means if I used my formula, if I replace T with 5,730 years, so if I wait that long, the amount I will end up with, so the left-hand side, so this here, the amount after 5,730 years, the answer I would get here, I don't know what that number is, but I know it's half of what I started with. So I know what's gonna show up here is exactly one half times A naught. You guys see the logic in that? Because that's what half-life says. Half-life says if you wait this long, this amount that you had at the beginning will drop to and give you exactly half of it. So even though I don't know what this amount is, I do know that this is going to be half of that. So it's half times that amount, right? So this is the cool part, right? The cool part is that I can actually literally take that A naught out of the equation because it's multiplied here by half and it's multiplied here by the exponential. So I can divide both sides by A naught and that A naught is arrivederci, it's gone, right? So if that's gone, then we're left with one half equals e to the 5730 times k. I could write it like that. But look at that equation. I don't have any more letters left over besides k, and that's the one we want to solve for. So we can handle this. We can get we can solve for the k. Now again, how do you solve that? Well, of course, we're going to use the techniques we learned in the previous section on solving exponential and logarithmic equations. So remember, the moral of the story from that previous section or previous video is that to solve, to, to solve ex exponential equations, you have to bring in a log, right? So I have one term equals one term, which is good news. What I'm going to do here is I need to cancel out the E. So what do I do to cancel out the E? I'm going to have to bring in the log that has the same base, which is ln. So I'm going to apply ln to both sides. So this becomes ln of 1 half, which we could also write as 0.5, by the way, equals ln of E to the power of 5730k. So here comes the good news. Ln and E cancel each other's out. So this ends up with Ln of 1 half equals to 5730K, which means K is Ln of 1 half divided by 5730. So that's actually a useful answer for us to save because we'll, we, we will use it for the next step. So that's the value of the K. That's the decay rate. Now, you're probably thinking, wait a minute, that's not negative. I thought you said that this is decay and so K should be negative. Well, it is negative because ln of some number, if you take a ln, a log of some number between 0 and 1, you get a negative. So if you actually punch this in your calculator, if you do ln, so if I do ln of 0.5 and then divide that by 5,730, this is going to give you negative 
so this will give you negative 0 0.000209 blah 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 All right so this is roughly neg negative I'll write the decimal negative point zero 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 one two zero nine six eight and so on okay i just wanted to show you that it's it's actually a negative number right but we're not going to use the decimal because if you use a decimal approximation and then you use that in another calculation it makes your final answer less accurate so i'm not going to round until the very last uh step all right ha have we solved the problem no we just found the k but that's good news because when i go back to my formula if i found the k then i already know what number the k is and that's not going to change so one of the unknowns is taken care of but now we still have to answer the question now what did the question ask for they want time they want how long ago so they want me to solve for t but solve for t when? Solve for t when the amount dropped to 79% of the original amount. So now we get to use that clue. And I'm going to try to squeeze that in here. Let me see. If it doesn't work out, we'll just use another page here. So let's completed here so I'm gonna start out with this formula again but this time it's gonna be a naught e to the kt keep having these circle circles and all that stuff and we know that the amount that exists now we don't know exactly what the number is but we know in percentages it's 0.79 percent of a zero so if I say percentage of something, it's multiplication. So point, uh, so 79% of the or original amount means 79% times A0 or A0. And what's 79%? We can write it as a decimal. So that's 0.79A0. So this means right now, the amount that we have is 0.79A0. And now we are again... In the same scenario that we were here, we can cancel out the A0 from both sides if you divide by it. So this cancels out. And what's left over is 0.79 equals E to the KT. So here we are again. We can bring the LN to get rid of the E. So this is LN of 0.79 equals LN of E to the KT. So this gives you KT equals ln of 0.79 and now remember we're solving for t so i'm going to divide by k so divide all of this by k so t is equal to ln of 0.79 over k but wait a minute what is the k well we know what the k is the k is this so we can plug it in there so it's basically point ln of 0.79 divided by this fraction here. And remember, dividing by a fraction is equivalent to multiplying by the reciprocal of that fraction. So if I want to divide ln of 0.79 by this fraction, I could instead multiply it by this fraction flipped. So this becomes t equals ln of 0.79 times 5730 on top over ln of 0.5 in the denominator one half is the same as 0.5 good so now i've got everything and i can just punch all that in my calculator to get a number of years so if i do ln of 0.79 times 5730 divided by ln of 0.5 this gives me 1948.6 so roughly if i round to the nearest year 1949 
And then we can actually state this in, in the form of a sentence. So I'm actually going to put it here. So the volcanic eruption occurred approximately One thousand nine hundred forty nine years ago. And we could circle this. That's my final answer. Isn't that cool? So that's an example of carbon dating. And of course, if you want this to be an accurate answer, you want this percentage to be accurate and that's what the archaeologists estimate on the field right and and they can quickly do this kind of problem they can do this in a quick on their phone if they wanted to or a cal pocket calculator or a scientific calculator can they can just punch this in and they can figure out quickly how long ago something existed that's why every time you watch discovery channel or national geographic or you watch or a science channel or some of those shows they will show you somebody, archaeologist, talking to the to the screen and telling you, hey, this, you know, this thing here existed 50,000 years ago. And you're thinking, how do they know that? Well, carbon dating. And that's, it's not that hard. It's a small, a small math problem that they can do. And it can give them a very useful information, very informative information. So... Uh, Unfortunately, I didn't find the example I had for the lasso prepared, so we didn't get to do a problem like this. But uh, the cat is out of the bag now, so I'll tell you what the lasso caves uh, are. The estimation for the lasso caves, oops. So the estimation for the lasso caves is circa 17,000 to 15,000 years ago. So this is the estimation of how old how old those paintings are in that cave, which is amazing, right? And again, they did that actually with carbon dating, but they also did that with forensic uh, research later to confirm it, right? which is a much more accurate method. All right, so there you have it. That was a nice example that told you a little bit about history about the Lasso Caves and also... Um, work through a carbon dating problem. Okay, let's do a slightly less fun problems, but they're kind of a necessity to, to show you so you understand these. So a reminder that interest uh, typically is when it's compounded grows exponentially. So compound interest. So let's first explain what that even means. So I'm going to give you a little comparison here. So compound interest versus simple interest. So let's say you invest $100. So that's your principal. So $100. And the interest rate is 5%. And it's annual and you're gonna use the same thing for the simple case and I'm gonna show you the contrast between the two all right so we're gonna basically track what happens to your balance after a few years so after one year, the amount of money that you'll have will be 100 plus 5% times 100. So that's going to be $100 plus 0 0.05 times $100 which is 5% of 100, which is basically $5, right? So this will be $5. All 
in the simple interest after one year is going to be exactly the same because this is compounded annually so it's going to be hundred dollars plus five percent of a hundred dollars which again will end up being 105 dollars so no significant nothing no difference between them so this by the way should be 105 I said that no let me fix this here so this should be 105 dollars so you know, i'm gonna end up with just five dollars that'd be crazy all right so what happens after a year later so after two years from the initial investment so two years after the initial investment the way you compute the balance for the compound case versus the simple case is different the simple case, you're still going to keep adding the 5% that you figured out off of the original amount. So that doesn't change. You're going to keep adding just 5 bucks. So after two years, it's going to be 105 plus $5, which is $110. But for the compound interest case, you don't use the same interest amount because this part here is called the interest amount so you're not going to keep using that five no you recompute that what does that mean that means you find five percent of the 105 and you add it to the 105 so you're going to do 105 plus five percent of 105 and that's going to give you five dollars and a quarter and then you add it to the 105 so your balance gets updated to 110 dollars and 25 cents so you already see that these two answers start to split away from one another and that's just after two years what if i wait another year so after three years Then this is going to be 110.25 plus 5% of 110.25. And if you compute that, so I'm going to use my calculator, 0 0.05 times 110.25, add it to 110.25, that gives you $117.25. Seventy six cents. How about the uh, simple? The simple you just keep adding five dollars, the same uh, initial five percent off of the principal. You don't compound the interest, right? So it's only computed once, and that's the same amount you keep adding every year. Compound means you every time you want to find the interest to add, you have to compute it based on the updated balance. So that's the difference. So this will be a hundred and ten plus five, which will be just 150. So now the difference is slightly even more significant. It's off by $2.76, and that's just after three years. And keep in mind, this is just a contrived example where we only make a small, a small investment and we're doing annual compounding. So if I made this compounded quarterly, like four times a year, then you'll see this amount grow a little bit faster. So this goes to show you that the two amounts start to di diverge a little bit. Now, what's even more significant is how they grow. This is growing at an arithmetic rate where we're adding five every year. So when you go to graph it, this is a linear growth. So if you try to draw a picture of how the amount of your balance is growing over time, it's doing something like this starts at $100 and grows linearly and the slope of this line by the way the slope of this line is going to be the growth rate which is five okay but this here is not growing uh, linearly it's growing exponentially so it's going to have a graph I'm not going to graph it accurately, but just to kind of give you a sketch of it, the graph will look more like this. 
So it's an exponential growth. So it's starting at the same amount, but it's definitely growing a lot faster. So, and you'll notice this after a few years. And imagine if this was not a uh, hundred, if this was like 10,000, then you'll see a big difference in between them after a few years. And the longer you wait, the farther the difference is. Because again, uh, at the beginning, they may be close, but after, if you wait long enough, this will shoot all the way up in comparison to this that's going steadily at the same linear rate. So that's the difference between compound interest and simple interest. So that's why credit that's that's why credit card companies are rich, right? Because what they do is they give you a credit card and you can use it and they hit you with an interest of 38% on every purchase. And if you uh, get excited and you find a lot of cool things you want to buy and then you start you go a little bit crazy on the shopping and you can't pay off your balance every month, then every amount that you have left over on your credit card is getting uh, a 38% interest or higher, depending on what kind of deal you've got with them. So you can imagine how that debt, why that debt grows up very quickly. And people who are not comfortable and educated about how that changes, it can easily uh, get out of control to the point where they 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 lose, they they can just can keep up. They can't pay off their their debt, and then they have to file bankruptcy and they have to lose their house. They have to once your credit uh, score is bad, then you can get loans for anything else. You can get a loan for a house. You can get a loan for a car. You can do anything, right? So, so that's that's how the card the credit card companies get rich because of this scheme, the difference between compound interest versus linear interest. But it also works the other way around. So this is why people in Wall Street get rich, because when they actually work with investments and they have some kind of return on investment that has a certain percentage and commission on it, then again, that's also built up exponentially. So they could end up making money at this rate instead of having debt grow at this rate right so it also works the same way when you have like a savings account so if you have so folks who have a lot of money and they have a lot of it put in some kind of savings account or some kind of certificate of deposit account or some kind of mutual fund or a hedge fund then that can grow very quickly and the more money they have, the more money they make, and the quicker it grows, depending on how the fund is managed. So again, in understanding these little things, nuances between compound versus simple makes a big difference. It's exponential versus linear. All right, let's do an example. So let's say we have this scenario uh, where they say, okay, we'll do, let's see how much time, yeah, maybe we'll do one example here just to kind of show you this. So let's say we have uh, the following scenario. So Susan invests $5,000 at 3.4% interest compounded continuously find the balance after seven years all right so we discussed this in a video on uh, exponentials and we said that there's a formula. There are actually two formulas, right? There's one that's called the PERT formula, which is A equals P times E to the RT. And that's the one you use anytime they say uh, the interest is compounded continuously. If it's compounded a certain number of times per year, then you use this other formula, which is A equals P times 1 plus R over N to the NT where n is number of times 
interest is compounded in one year. So if they say monthly, n will be 12. If they say quarterly, n will be 4. If they say uh, semi-annually, n will be 2. If they say annually, n is 1, and so on. But if they say continuously, we don't even worry about this. This is the formula we want to use. So the P is how much money you put in. So that's called the initial amount or the investment, the principal amount. That's what the P stands for. That's the initial investment. R is the interest rate, but you have to watch out. Don't put the actual percentage, put the decimal, right? So it's if it's 3.4%, I'm not going to put 3.4 for R. I'm going to put 0 0.034, right? T is the number of years. So in this problem, I already know that P is $5,000. R is 0 0.034 and T is seven years. So I've got all of the letters on this side. The E again is the E for exponential. That's something that already uh, your calculator can compute for you. Uh, so all I need to do is just punch all this stuff in and get the answer, which is the amount. And that's gonna give me the amount of money uh, Susan is gonna have in her account after uh, seven years. All right, so let's go ahead and do it. So this is gonna be 5,000 e to the point zero three four three four times seven i'm going to put parentheses around that so again when you punch this in your calculator if you press the ln button that will access ln so that'll give you ln of something and waits for you to enter what's inside the ln we don't want ln we want e so typically e in most calculators e is right next to the ln button written in small print which basically means that if you want to get E instead of LN, you have to press the second or the shift button in combination with the LN. That's how you access this. And if you do that, it will give you something like this. And then it waits for you to enter what the exponent is. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to use that and I'm going to enter this product in my exponent and I'm going to close the parentheses. And that will compute this part. That will compute the exponential. But I'm going to take that answer and multiply it by 5,000. And with money, you round to the nearest set. So you round to two decimal places. So this is going to be second ln, and then 0 0.034 times 7, close parentheses, multiply that by 5,000. All right, so this gives me approximately 6,000. 343 and 55 cents. So when you get um, the answer, then you typically with these word problem with these word problems, you get the answer in the form of sentence. So the balance after seven years will be 6,343.55 dollars. 55 cents right all right so that's so so that's the answer right so let's think about that for a second look it didn't take too long for that 5,000 to increase by this much it get got to this point so it increased by a thousand dollars and three hundred and forty three thousand three hundred forty three dollars and fifty five cents I mean, that's a significant increase in 40 and five and seven years right so this goes to show you again how compound interest, if it's an investment, can be beneficial because your investment can grow very quickly. Now, a question that uh, investors usually have is when they have many different setups, because you go to somebody in a bank and you say, OK, I'm going to I'm going to I have five thousand dollars. I want to invest it. What do you suggest? They're going to come to you with many different setups. So they may say, okay, you can invest it in this account at 2.3% uh, compounded annually or at 3% compounded quarterly or at 5.4% compounded monthly. And it's very hard for you to know which one is best because there are too many variables. There are two variables. There's the 
interest is different and there's also the how, how often they compound and both of them play role on whether you make your money a lot quicker or uh, slower so a good question that typically investors ask to help them um, basically get a much more direct answer and decisive answer is they don't say okay uh, go ahead and run the numbers for all of these no they say okay I want to know how long it will take for my money to double for example and then you can then the uh, financial uh, manager or the consultant can run the numbers and they, they can tell you well if you invested in this account it will double after seven years and if you invest in this account your money will double after five years and then if you invest in this account it will double after 10 years then it gives you enough information for you to make a decision on which account you want to go with right because you could say oh no I want I want it to double as quickly as possible so I'm gonna pick the one account that's gonna make it double a lot quicker so a typical question is this doubling time right and it doesn't have to be doubling it could be tripling right so let's see if we can do a problem like that right so what let's see if we can find the doubling time so how long will it take to double an investment compounded continuously <clears throat> at 4.5% Okay, first of all, we got a lock on the formula. Continuously means the PERT formula, right? But when they say how long, we're not solving for the amount. We're solving for T, time. So T is what we want to solve for. So if you want to solve for T, you have to know everything else. At least we think we do. We need to know what R is. They gave us that. That's 0.045 because it's 4.5%. We need to know the P. Well, they didn't give us that. And we need to know the A, they didn't give us that. Hmm, that's kind of weird. So how am I going to do this? Well, even though they didn't give me the P and the A, I do know a relationship between them. I know that I want to double the initial investment. So the A should be double the P, which means A is twice P. And now we are in a very similar situation to that uh, half-life problem earlier. Because remember earlier when we got the initial amount to show up on both sides, we could cancel it out. So we could cancel out the P. And we can solve the problem even though we don't know how much money we're putting in. So cancel this out. So we got 2 equals E to the point zero four five t And I've got enough information to help me solve for T. All I have to do is get rid of the E. So I'm going to have to bring in our good old friend ln on both sides. So this gives you ln of 2 equals ln of e to the point 0, 0.045t. These will cancel. So you get ln of 2 equals to 0, 0.045t. And then you simply divide by 0, 0.045 on both sides. So t if I punch this in my calculator, ln of 2 is 0.69 something, and then you divide that by 0 0.045. This has given me 15.4 years. In fact, we could even write it in years and months, for example. So I could write this as 15 years, and then take this 0.4. And multiply it by 12. So if I take 0.4 times 12, that gives me 4.8. So that gives me four months. And I could even go with days if I wanted to. So if I if if I wanted to go with days, I take 0.8 multiplied by 30, which is roughly how many days are in a typical month. So 
that will give you a number of days. But we could actually put 15 years and roughly, if we want to just stick to months, 4.8 can be rounded up to five months. So we'll just put 15, point, 15 years and five months. So it will take 15 years and five months to double the investment. Now what's cool about this is that it doesn't matter how much you're putting in. It's all decided by, based on the interest rate. That's really the most significant part. And the fact that it's compounded continuously. So those are the significant details. So based on those, you've got all the information you need to know how long it's gonna double. It doesn't matter whether you invest $1,000 or 10,000, it will take you 15.4 years to double it, eat either amount, which is kinda cool. All right, I think we did enough examples to give you a variety of applications. Uh, so you have some application problems in your homework as well, so try those, and of course, don't hesitate to let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for your time, and thank you for watching.